Alexa project. My fingers move on the piano slowly, gently, lightly, resting their weight on the piano keys for but a beat before moving again. They beckon the piano to sing, and the piano sings. But my fingers are too moved by the piano's music. I used to think that this piece was blissful and calming, yet today a tinge of sorrow hidden in the sonata surfaces. It surfaces with the music. The music reaches her hand out to me. I take her hand, and I walk with her through an invisible land in a melancholic white world. Sometimes the faceless music smiles, and I smile back. Other times she frowns, and I follow suit. Of course, in one sense, none of this is actually happening. But in another sense, if I couldn't count on this experience, I couldn't play piano. It can't be real, but it's real. In my heart, I feel that this is true magic. Truer than the daily spellcasting that anyone with a bit of mana in their bloodstream can conjure up. The last patrons have just left, so I shall close up for the night. You may stop playing now. A kind motherly voice brings me back to the real world. I see a woman with a gentle smile speaking to me. My sonata is still flowing through the rooms of the cafe, with a slow but pleasant melody as lustrous as the place itself. Allow me to finish this piece, Mrs. Howard? It won't take me long to finish. Just as she said, there are no more guests in the cafe. Waiters and waitresses are clearing the dishes off the tables. A maid is sweeping the floor. From the kitchen, I can hear the sound of running water. The middle-aged noblewoman nods. The smile never leaving her lips. Of course, Elise. Play as long as you wish. I took you on because of your endless passion for this instrument. I know quite well that you play for love, not for money. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. Oh, and don't forget that we're holding the salon tomorrow. Mr. and Mrs. Howard's cafe is very popular among overchery and aristocracy and bourgeoisie. Not only because it is gorgeous and serves delicious food, but also because Mrs. Howard regularly holds gatherings in which the intelligentsia discuss and debate a variety of topics, from politics to magical science and engineering. The latter is the reason why, despite being situated in an aristocratic housing complex, patrons aren't limited to aristocrats. Conservatoire graduates particularly love these salons. I won't forget, ma'am. After giving another friendly nod, the hostess turns and walks to the drink bar. And I continue my journey with the Sonata. My pocket chronometer shows a little past midnight when we finish cleaning the cafe. Thank you for your help, Elise. It was my pleasure, Mrs. Howard. If you will excuse me, I shall take my leave. Of course. Do be careful out there. Those proletariat are about at this time of night. Lately I've heard terrible things. It seems they'll go after anyone they find. I will. Goodbye, Mrs. Howard. I leave the cafe after bidding my farewell. The street is completely empty under the starlit night sky where police carriages are roaming to and fro. A carriage flies by me, low and slow. The policeman riding inside gestures to me with a playful salute, to which I reply with a cheery hand wave. Satisfied, the policeman pilots his carriage away and resumes his patrol. It wasn't always like this, but a year ago, some proles started assaulting people in the city. It seems like it's been getting more frequent ever since. How did they get mana potions for something like this? 
from the cafe. Fortunately, I only have to walk 100 steps before reaching the intersection that connects the complex housing the cafe to a main street. From there, it's only a few more paces to an omnibus stop. As dangerous as the city has become, nobody but aristocrats would dine at the cafe if there weren't an omnibus stop nearby. I have to be careful myself. Night Rider buses are few and far between, so I make sure to leave the cafe 15 minutes before my bus arrives. It should arrive in... I glance at my chronometer. Two minutes. Two minutes later, I board the omnibus and breathe a small sigh of relief. There are a few others on the bus, and their energy sapped after a long day of work. Since the buses become infrequent after midnight, they take longer routes and make frequent stops through a number of faraway districts, unlike the daytime omnibuses that fly more directly between two terminals. There was a time when I loved detours like this. I arrive almost an hour later. Thankfully, only a short distance away from my home. <sighs> Elise? Aretha is still yawning and rubbing her eyes in front of the kitchen when she murmurs my name. Aretha, have you not gone to bed yet? Work, deadline, sleepy, need coffee. She answers with half-closed eyes. If you would not mind waiting a minute, I could brew up a cup for you. Um... Elise? Yes, Aretha? Elise? Yes? Elise? I yeah <laughs> I know you've been working at Howard's for two years now, but that high-class lady talk doesn't suit you at all. Um... <laughs> That's my Elise. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to bed. Night-night. Huh? What about my coffee? Weren't you going to make it yourself? But I prefer my coffee made with your love. <laughs> what kind of taste is that? Elise, Elise, you know what? Instead of coffee, would you play the piano for me? Aretha, it's past midnight. Your mother is sleeping. And our neighbors, and everyone. Yes, we now have a piano at home. It's not that my job at the cafe has made me rich, but about a year after I started working, I had saved up enough to purchase a second-hand piano from one of Alanis's acquaintances. Before buying the piano, I always had to go to the cafe early and ask Mrs. Howard to let me practice. Now I can practice at home. Oh, right. Piano is no good. Hmm. Maybe you could energize me with your magic? That'd keep you up until morning, and then you'd make me stay up with you. Elise, I got it. Let's stay up till morning. No, I'm sleepy. For some reason, Aretha is sitting at my desk, her eyes glued to a stack of drawings of magic system diagrams. On the desk sits a steaming cup of coffee, apparently the flavor of my love. I sit on my bed, sipping coffee from my own cup. A dash of sugar has made it bittersweet. Hmm, then the fire flows here and... Uh-oh. I'd need a way to block the water from the second input. I don't dislike Aretha being in my room so late. I don't see her much except on weekends since we both started working full-time. Aretha's already gone by the time I wake up in the morning. When she comes home, I've gone to the cafe. And when I come home, she's asleep. Aretha, are you still working on the calculator? Nope, that was done a long time ago. I had a working proof of concept for my capstone, and the first prototype was successfully built the year after that. She explains all this with a bright expression. Can I see the prototype? Well, the thing is, the calculator is as big as an omnibus, so it's a little hard to move from MM. <laughs> after graduating from Conservatoire des Overture more than four years ago, Aretha went on to work as a magical engineer in Magical Mechanical Research and Development Center. When she was still working on her final year project in Conservatoire, nobody had paid any attention to her research. But the day after she presented it to the examiners, it made headlines everywhere. She had built a proof of concept for a magic machine that could perform simple arithmetic calculation. Think 3 plus 4 or 5 plus 6. As long as both numbers were less than 16, the machine could produce the sum of two numbers. 
Lord Godwin came to our house the day the news was published in Overture Science Journal. Then what are you working on now? A magic analytical engine. Aretha watches me take a sip from my cup with enthusiasm gleaming on her face. What is an analytical engine? <laughs> it's going to be really cool, Elise. So, what is an analytical engine? It's like the calculator, but it can be used for general purpose computation. You can customize what it calculates and give it instructions that will be executed according to a defined logic. Sounds complicated. <laughs> Elise, Elise, are you interested in knowing how magic machines can process mathematical logic? No, not really. <laughs> I knew it. Only people like me would be interested in that kind of stuff. So, you're working on a computing machine that is even more complex than the calculator, huh? Your analytical engine sounds really impressive. <laughs> it's not just my analytical engine. I mean, I'm the lead researcher, but I have a team of scientists and engineers working on different parts of the machine. Whoa, you have your own team? Yeah, I've been working in MM for almost five years, remember? Besides, the analytical engine is the continuation of the research I did in Conservatoire. Five years. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> hmm? What's funny? What's funny? Five years ago, I was also an MM employee. So, technically, I'm your senior. <laughs> You're right. No! That's so not right! I was just a lowly factory worker whose work was to cast fire all day. It was totally different from your job. <laughs> I mostly just stare at magic system diagrams all day every day, so maybe it really isn't that much different. <laughs> Five years, huh? Time flies. So that means it's been five years since the incident. It was so kind of Alanis and Aretha to let me continue living with them, even though I had lost my job as Franz's research assistant. Sometimes I would help out in Alanis's clinic, but other than that I was unemployed until I got hired by Mrs. Howard a couple of years ago. Aretha? Hmm? You said the calculator is as big as an omnibus, right? How big would the analytical engine be? Hmm... Aretha rolls her eyes up and scratches her head. About as big as our house, I think. Maybe bigger. That's huge! <laughs> yeah, it's not something you'll find in any household. Only governments or big institutions will be able to own an analytical engine. I think there is a world market for maybe five analytical engines. That's too bad. I was hoping we'd have one in our house. No way. Besides, by my estimate, the analytical engine is still more than ten years away from completion. Ten years? It's amazing that MM is willing to invest in something like that. Yep, Lord Godwin is extremely excited about this research. He's going to unveil a very early, doesn't really work yet model of the analytical engine next fire day in Conservatoire de Overture, and I'll be presenting. I'm going to say in front of the audience, MM's latest invention is magical, mechanical, analytical. How cool is that? Next fire day is... One, two, three, four... Five days from now. No wonder you're still working even though it's already three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't normally work until... Huh? Three? Isn't it still two o'clock? Oh my gosh, you're right. I've got to work. Aretha is already gone when I wake up in the morning. Two hours before noon, according to the chronometer. I sit on the bed, still feeling sluggish from staying up so late. Or was it early? By the time Aretha and I stopped chatting, I was already tired, but the coffee was keeping me awake. I think it was four o'clock when I finally fell asleep. I remember that Aretha was still working then. Which means she couldn't have had more than four hours of sleep, considering that she always leaves for work at eight. Her determination is amazing. 
As for me, I don't have anything to do until evening, because the cafe doesn't open until sundown. Sleepy. Not even the warm sunlight and the light breeze outside the window are enough to make me want to get out of bed and go outside. It's now the transition from winter to spring, when the weather just can't seem to make up its mind whether to be hot or cold. Compared to that, my bed is a hundred times more tempting. <sighs> That's it. I'm going back to sleep. I let my back fall on the cozy bed and close my eyes, seeking solace under the warm blanket. Bad, Elise! Bad! I force myself to jump out of bed and drag my feet to the door while stifling a yawn. Good morning, Elise. Good <sighs> morning, Alanis. <laughs> You're exactly like Aretha this morning. <laughs> Has she left? Yes, she didn't seem completely awake, but she went to work nonetheless. Aretha's willpower is strong. Behind Alanis, some patients are already waiting in the waiting room for their examination. This house is also used as a psychiatry clinic where Alanis takes patients. She has a license to diagnose and treat patients, but she spends most of her time talking with the people who come in. Just talking seems to help most people. From time to time, I still help out in the clinic by curing patients who happen to have an illness or energizing those who are physically drained from overworking. Ah, uh, have you started the psychiatry sessions? No, but I will in a minute. I've just finished making preparations. I'll help you out. Just give me a second to energize myself. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Why don't you just take a walk outside and breathe some fresh air? Remember, Elise, your real strength lies in your own mind. Don't always rely on your magic. Aww. Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> With a smile, she turns away and walks to her patients. She greets them, opens the door to her examination room, and leads an older woman inside. Once Alanis has disappeared into her examination room, I take a quick shower, have brunch, and head outside for a walk. The air outside is chilly, but not unpleasant. At this hour, there aren't many people, because almost everyone is at work. Children are all at school. Now, Alanis told me to take a walk, but where should I go? I don't like wandering around without any real destination. Maybe I should try the omnibus. Heading to the omnibus stop, I walk past an old couple sitting on a bench. I smile at them, and they smile back at me. At the omnibus stop, a young woman and her toddler boy are chatting merrily while waiting for the bus to arrive. I talk and laugh with them until a minute later a bus arrives. When was it? Two years? Three years ago? That moving your body inside an omnibus stopped feeling like you were suddenly losing half your body weight? An omnibus interior used to be low-gravity environment, because the gravity was partially nullified in order to make it easier to carry the omnibus using levitation magic. Nowadays, the omnibus is equipped with a second magic machine that cancels out the nullification of gravity inside without affecting the gravity outside. So the bus is still light for the driver who steers it, but doesn't feel jarring for the passengers. Along with other smaller improvements, the omnibus of today is undoubtedly better than the omnibus of five years ago. And it's not just the omnibuses that have seen improvements lately. Our room heater can automatically warm the air to the perfect temperature. The coffee machine can brew a cup of coffee in under a minute. Chronometers can now last a week in a single mana charge. Magic machine technology has progressed so far and so fast in only five years. There are now more magic machines in the city. They're more advanced, they're more useful and helpful. They make the lives of people in Overture easier. The mother and the little boy stand up from their seats when the bus stops in front of a bookstore. The boy waves at me as he gets off the bus. I still have no idea where the omnibus is taking me. Looking outside, I realize that I'm already quite far away from the main city area. At the next stop, I get off the bus. The street is familiar. I haven't been here in a long time, and many things have changed since the last time I was here. But I still remember this street. This is close to the factory where I used to work. The factory. I wonder if it has changed. 
I wonder if my friends still work there. Before I know it, I'm already making a left turn onto the factory road. Standing outside a factory building, I peek inside through an open window. A young girl stands in front of a big furnace. Toilsomely, she casts fire to set the furnace ablaze. Her sweat evaporates in the heat. Around her, other workers are freezing the molten metal, streaming down to the molds in front of them. A worker casts winged to rotate a gear in a mechanical system. People move chassis parts from conveyor belt to conveyor belt. They talk little, their minds focused on casting their magic spells. In contrast to the chilly air outside, the air inside the factory building is suffocating. A supervisor walks around the assembly line. When the girl in front of the furnace stops casting her fire, he yells at her, prompting her to cast the spell again. And so the scene repeats, and repeats again. A fire bursts. Liquid turns into solid. A gust of wind blows. Gears turn. Conveyor belts move. A chassis is assembled. Then the scene repeats. Again. And again. The workers all have this blank look on their faces. The girl in front of the furnace keeps shooting fire from her hands. But there is no fire in her own eyes. The workers who free chassis parts wear expressions as cold as the now solid metal on the molds. The factory is still exactly the same as it was five years ago. Not a thing has changed. In the city, people's lives are made easier by magic machines, but here, still, almost every job is done by casting magic spells manually. It's also still done by the same underpaid and overworked proles. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Is the MM in which Aretha works really the same MM I'm seeing right now? There are some faces that I recognize among the workers, but I decide not to approach them. I don't know what I would say to them. Jude, however... Jude isn't here. I leave the factory, in my force of habit. Walk in the direction of the Pearl Streets, which I used to take whenever I went home from the factory five years ago. Unlike five years ago, however, my presence isn't met with warm smiles and kind greetings. The Proles now have this scornful look on their faces. They look at me like I'm a stranger. And lots of things, I guess I am. I am no longer one of them. I recognize some of these people, and I know they recognize me, too. There's a moment when a surprised look crosses their faces when they see me, but we don't say anything. They ignore me, and I choose to not interact with them. I feel indescribably sad about this. I feel like I've lost a part of myself. Something that makes me me is no longer there. Who am I? Elise was a factory worker who lived among the proles. But now I'm in a factory and I don't feel like I belong. Why? What is left of me? Am I still me? I quicken my pace, trying to escape the dread of being in a place that does not want me here. Escape? Five years ago, these people were the closest thing I had to a family. Now we're just strangers. But what's with their cases? There was hostility there, and envy. There was hate in their eyes. Has it always been like this? Have those eyes always been the ones with which the proletariat looked at the bourgeoisie? I don't think so. Something is wrong. Not far from the main city street, two proletariat men in messy clothes are standing on the side of a dusty street, leaning against the wall of a rundown shack. As I walk down the street, I overhear the men talking to each other. Hey, did you see him? Who? Him! Oh. Amadeus? Yes, yes. I didn't think I'd be able to see the leader himself, but he was there. With his leadership, I'm sure we'll win. The kingdom will be ours, and a bear's war will cease to exist. Amadeus and Libertad are what we needed this whole time. Libertad? Wasn't that group dissolved five years ago? 
I tell you what, if Amadeus needs me, I am ready to lay down my life for him and Libertod. We're all ready. Amadeus and the Libertins have been fighting for us for so long. It's our duty to do whatever we can to support them. I can't make out anymore. So, Libertad is back, and apparently with a new leader. They called him Amadeus. I've never heard of him before, but he sounds like bad news for the bourgeois. When I'm back on the city street, the sun is already glaring low in the west. Just the right time to go to the cafe. Today is salon day, so I can't come late. Libertad still exist. Since when does Libertad engage in a fight with the police in the middle of the city? And then I notice a man standing a safe distance away, watching the battle. Was his crime that bad? Wasn't being locked in prison enough? Well, he is dead, surely, but evidently there's someone else who's trying to be a second Theodore Hendrix. Amadeus? There is no sound of blazing fire from the furnace, no shriek of clanging metal. No clattering of mechanical gears. This factory is long dead. Do you know this place? Let's go! Project! 